Good to see you here this morning. Uh, I recommend that you don't wear your t-shirts Tuesday, okay? You don't want to wear these in the snowstorm and all the 40 degree weather. And so, uh, isn't that amazing? 90, 100 degrees one day and it's going to be 34 in a couple of days after that. I'm glad God's in control. Let's pray. Father, we thank you this morning as we come together to, to worship, to celebrate what you did for us on Calvary, to celebrate your coming back for us. Thank you for each one that is here this morning, and we just pray as we go through this service that once again we'll allow you to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Satisfied with just a cottage below, a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a Tempted, tormented, and tempted. 
pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. You have truly blessed us, Father, with giving us life, hope, in a troubled time. We look forward to the day when we join you in our eternal home. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for our church and our pastor. We pray that you will give us ears to hear and hearts to respond today. And Father, if there's one that does not know you, that today will be the day of their salvation. We thank you for the faithfulness of our church in giving. We pray that you will take our gifts and use them for your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. one in heaven what do you think they're doing right now well, and we think about um, what heaven's going to be like we can't 
we can't fathom. I thank you for the pictures, and they just they just kind of give us a glimpse of of what it's going to be like. Amazing. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. We'll talk a little bit about it this morning. Let's stand together. After we read our scripture, Sharon has a song for us. Revelation chapter 11. Beginning with verse 9, we'll go through the whole chapter. And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise, and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles. And the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the candlestick standing before God of the earth. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven, that it will rain not in days of their prophecy, have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all the plagues as often as they will. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them, and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the graves. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half the Spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. In the same hour was there a great earthquake, and the tenth part of the city fell, and in that earthquake was slain men, seven thousand, and the remnant was affrightened, and gave glory to God of heaven. The second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seat fell on their, upon their face and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and has reigned. And the nations were angry, and their wrath has come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that they shouldn't give reward unto the servants, the prophets, and to the saints. Them that fear the name, small and great, shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testaments. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Let's pray. Once again, Lord, we marvel at your word and what it, how fulfilling it is, how truthful it is, and how it tells us things to come. And so as we study this portion of scripture this morning, may our hearts be open to what the Spirit wants to say to us. May we listen, may we rejoice, and may we be ready. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. It 
tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. It tells me what my Father hath in store for every day, and though This morning yeah. yeah thank you for the music everybody well the lesson today it really is today I mean it could happen right Amen. today pretty quick Amen. you know as we study the book of Revelation it discusses the return of Christ in his glory and the first time Jesus came of course 2,000 years ago it was in humiliation because as a man and walking this earth, he was despised, he was rejected, persecuted. Eventually he was executed. But this time, he will come, not as a man, but as God in glory with exaltation. He's going to set up his kingdom. And in chapters four and five of Revelation, remember there was a vision of heaven. There was that rainbow, a sea of glass, the title deed in his right hand, trying to find out who was worthy. It was only the worthy lamb, which was Jesus Christ. And as he takes that title deed, he begins to unroll it. Seven seals, which is the total description of Christ coming in power. Understand that. We've seen the seven seals and heard six trumpets. But now we're kind of in a pause here in chapter 10 chapter, and chapter 11. The seventh trumpet will be blown in chapter 11, verse 15, which we'll begin to see it here in a little bit. But the seventh trumpet, when it is blown, will bring out seven bowls or vials of judgment. So there's even more judgment to come, which is going to be even worse. Last week in chapter 10, we saw a couple of things, some very unusual things. Remember the angel that came. We believe that that's going to be Jesus Christ. And the event that takes place is he places one foot on the sea and one foot on the lamb, land because he wants to claim what belongs to him. And then he roars and he gets an answer back. And remember, it was seven loud thunders. And John is told, don't write any more of this, of those seven thunders. But the announcement simply is there's no more delay. The time is over. Man's time is over. So he gives John the book and he says, eat this book and you're going to taste it and it is going to be sweet to the taste, but bitter to the stomach. Simply telling us that when you read the gospel of Jesus Christ and you accept Christ as Savior, it's sweet. But somebody who rejects Jesus Christ, the reading of the gospel is bitter to them. They don't understand and realize. And then in chapter 10 and verse 11, John was told to preach, preach it all, John, make them hear it. Preach it, John, preach it. Imagine all that John has seen and all that John has heard so far. The glory of Christ, the seven seals, six of the seven trumpets that he's heard. And we have learned from our study of Revelation that God has to judge whoever continues in sin. God must judge whoever continues in sin. Well, our introduction to our lesson for today, two other preachers come along. Here's to these two preachers, and you know they have a great message, the same message that John had, but also the same message that you and I have. Jesus Christ came to die for the sins of mankind. Accept him as your Lord and Savior, and you have eternal life. If you reject him, it's eternal damnation. That's their message, these two preachers. That was John's message. That is our message. 
And God has always had His preachers, Elijah and Elisha and Jeremiah and Jonah, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for these 2,000 years in this church age, there have always been those who stand up and preach the Word of God. But you don't need to stand behind a pulpit to preach the Word of God. You can be sitting in a coffee shop, or you can be in your living room, or you can be in a car talking to somebody that you're trying to share with them the gospel of Jesus Christ. You're the preacher for that time. The Holy Spirit is convicting that person, and God wants you to tell them how they can accept Jesus Christ. He is still pleading with men to repent. Those who are enjoying their sin, calling out to them, repent, repent. Can you imagine somebody who lives a life of sin and why, finally in the nighttime when they lay their head on their pillow and everything is quiet and they start to reflect and think about what's happening? Or somebody that's lying on their deathbed, never have accepted Christ as Savior, and they begin to realize that now they're going to step out into eternity, but where is it? What's going to happen? Preach it. Preach it is what he says. God always has his remnant of believers. Well, the seventh trumpet is going to sound soon. Before this tr seventh trumpet sounds, there's a message to be given to preachers to proclaim God's judgment on this wicked world. There are four special acts that we are going to see here in chapter 11. We begin in verse 1. The measuring. And there was given me a, raw, a reed like a rod. And the angel stood saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So John now, he sees himself in this vision. You ever seen yourself in a dream? Kind of scary sometimes, but sometimes it's all right. But here now John sees himself. And so he's going to play an active role in what is taking place. And so he's given this rod. It's a measuring stick. And they were about 20 feet. They were in their, it was a standard measuring stick of that day, about 20 feet long. And they were very stiff and they were used for measuring. Flexible, light, light enough to carry and to use. So John measured three things. Number one, measure the temple of God, the holy place, the holy of holies. Secondly, John measured the altar, this brazen altar where people brought and do their sacrifice. And third, John, I want you to measure the people. Worship in this temple. You know, when you talk about measuring, it has a couple of ideas. It carries with it two ideas. In Zechariah chapter 2, it shows a man is seen measuring Jerusalem. Picturing Jerusalem belongs to God, and God is going to judge, so he's mapping it out. Is that what John's doing? Well, maybe measuring has the idea of judging. Ezekiel 40, there's a different reason for measuring. He says the temple is measured. This is the millennial temple. This is a measurement of ownership. Judgment, ownership. Which temple is John measuring? In all of Jewish history, there were five temples. There was Solomon's temple. That, of course, is long gone. Zerubbabel's temple, that too is gone. Herod's temple, that too is gone. The tribulation temple, a temple during the seven year tribula tribulation. This is the temple that John sees. And then there's gonna be a millennial temple, the thousand years after the tribulation. And of course, it's not here yet. So this one that we're looking at, that John is measuring here in verse one, has to be the tribulation temple. During this tribulation, Israel will have a temple. The character of the temple, in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 27, it says you must have a temple in which to do sacrifice. Now, remember, the tribulation is seven years, and it's broken down into two, three and a half years first period, three and a half years the second one. This is the second three and a half years he's talking about, because it's going to be the desecration of the temple. It must be desolate until the consummation for the holy place and the great tribulation that's going to take place. So John is measuring it out because God is going to judge this temple. Well, what's going to be going on in the temple when God judges it? In Revelation chapter 13, which we'll study in a few weeks, it's going to be the Antichrist is going to set up an idol in this temple for the people to worship, to worship in this temple. God is going to destroy it. So in verse 1, he's measuring these things. And so the qualification is in verse 2. 
But the court which is without the temple, leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread under foot forty and two months. All right, this court doesn't belong to God. It's not a, a temple that, that they go in and worship God. The Gentiles will overrun the, the court for three and a half years. And it's not, of course, measured out. And they trample on the Jews for these three and a half years and so forth. We re remember reading two out of three Jews during the tribulation will be killed. The time of the Gentiles is from the time of Christ until the end of the tribulation. Luke chapter 21 and verse 24. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles be filled. So we know from the time of Christ, 2,000 years ago, all the way till now and into the tribulation, seven years, that's called the time of the Gentiles. And the Gentiles are always taking down uh, Israel, trying to. Zechariah chapter 14 says, just prior to the first three and a half years of Christ putting his feet on the land and the sea, Israel's going to be trampled. And we see that happening today. I mean, we may not see some things actually happening so much so physically, but everybody's against Israel and wants to take them out. You know, God has always had these heathen nations that try to trample out Israel. Well, God says, though, I've got a time limit. There's a time limit on evil. So let's look at that. Two messengers. Somebody's going to be preaching during these 42 months. And you've got to understand this. As much as now, even, the, even we as the church, as Christians, sometimes uh, if we are to mention Christ, we're going to be shouted at. We may not be physically persecuted. Other parts of the world they are. But during this time, this 42 months, during this tribulation, you better not mention Christ. You'll be killed. You will be killed. All right, so let's see what happens in verse 3. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. The speaker, he says, I. It's not identified, but it can only be God or Christ. God the Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. Witnesses. Two witnesses. Now this is used in the plural, which in uh, the Greek is martis, which we get our words martyr from. All right? Two witnesses who are martyrs. The thought is these are two actual men because the word witnesses always indicates that it's going to be a person doing this witnessing or this preaching. It's, it's kind of interesting. You remember when Jesus sent out his disciples, how did he send them out? two by two. And it seems the Bible requires two to, re to confirm it is fact or verify truth. So here's these two men, two witnesses, their responsibility is to prophesy. Now the word prophecy does not mean predict the future, it simply means to speak the truth. So these two men are going to speak forth to speak the truth. They are going to proclaim disasters the coming of the judgments of God. That's what they're going to tell the world. Now listen up. You know, if, if, if the rapture happened now and we went into the tribulation, this would be happening during our time. And as we see some of these events here, we can understand it with a lot of the things that are going on to now, now, even in our own country, in Seattle, in Portland, in Chicago, and places like that. We see some things taking place that uh, are, 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 we see it taking, actually happening. So let's see what happens here. All right, they're going to warn of the eternal hell that is to follow. They're going to preach the gospel. Their ministry will last three and a half years during the tribulation. This is when the Antichrist forces uh, opposition to the city of Jerusalem. They're, they're clothed in sackcloth, shows an attitude because the sackcloth is a rough, heavy, coarse clothing worn in the ancient times, which symboled a, a mourning or distress or grief, humility, if you will. So these two witnesses will put on this sackcloth as an object lesson to express the great sorrow for the wretched and unbelieving world. They're wearing this so they'll tell the people, we want you to hear this message because we really feel for you. And they're also gonna mourn. Mourn because of the desecration of the temple, the oppression of Jerusalem, those kinds of things. All right, let's see if we can figure out their identity in verse 4. 
These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. So now John identifies them. And this comes from Zechariah's vision in chapter 4, the book of Zechariah. Zechariah's prophecy looked forward to the restoration of Israel during the millennium. I mean, Israel's being destroyed during the tribulation, but they're going to be restored in the millennium, and so Zechariah prophesies that. And here it says in verse 4, the olive trees and the lampstands, it symbolizes this light of revival, since olive oil was commonly used in lamps to keep it lit. And these connecting lamps to the trees symbolizes a constant flowing of supply of the oil to lamp. It's going to keep burning. The revival is going to take place. Israel is going to be revived, just as God has always promised. It shows us the truth of God unto salvation, because it's not coming from human power, but the power of the Holy Spirit is taking place. All these two witnesses, they are going to lead a tremendous spiritual revival of Israel. Who are they? Well, some suggest that they are Moses and Elijah. Why would they say that? Well, because of the miracles that we're going to see these guys perform. Also in the Old Testament and Jewish tradition expected Moses and Elijah to return in the future. And because Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ at the Mount of Transfiguration, you remember that, and both of these men left the earth in unusual ways. Elijah never died. He was transported to heaven in a fairy, uh, fiery chariot, chariot. And God supernaturally buried Moses' body in a secret location. So maybe it is Elijah and Moses coming back as these two witnesses. Oh, they have tremendous power. Verse 5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouths and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. Whoever these men are will have supernatural power in order to do some miraculous deeds. And because of their preaching, they're going to be universally hated. Don't you know there are people that hate the gospel of Jesus Christ today? Don't you know there are people that hate the church? They hate you because you are a Christian and you say you're going to heaven and those who reject Christ are going to hell. So the, the, universally, these guys are going to be hated and there's going to be a great desire to harm them. But these evangelists, these two men will react with miraculous power because God doesn't want their ministry, ministry to stop. And so we see the ex extent of their power in verse 6. These have power to shut up heaven, that it rain not in the days of the prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth and all the plagues as often as they will. Wow, tremendous power. Haven't we seen the world already during the tribulation going through some very devastating harm to its food supply and all of those kinds of things? And now look, even more. And these two men will be invulnerable and unstoppable through their ministry for the three and a half years as they minister. They cannot stop these two guys. As much as they're going to try to stop them, they cannot stop them. God's protection is always on His own. All right. Look at their death in verse 7, though. And when they shall have finished, finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. God protects his own until they're finished with their ministry. Now this beast comes out. This is the first reference to the beast. But in the book of Revelation, there are 36 references. So we know there's a lot more to come. He comes out of the abyss, indicating that he is empowered by Satan. And Satan is called a dragon. So this guy is not Satan. In fact, this is a beast that becomes the world ruler. The world ruler. And this beast, this new world ruler, is going to try to imitate Christ. He wants to rule the world. He demands everybody's worship given to him. And he is energized by a demonic presence with power coming from the abyss. Can, and this is hard to imagine, to the joy and relief of the world that this beast will overcome these two witnesses and kill them. The world's going to rejoice because he has killed these two witnesses who are preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the world rejoices. Verse 8. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually is called Sodom and Gomorrah, which also our Lord was crucified. Why? There are dead bodies lying there. 
They want to dishonor them. And don't you know that today everybody's going to be watching? They're going to turn on their televisions and they're going to watch these two guys who are dead. Jerusalem, once God's city, will be overrun by such evil. It is going to be wicked, wicked, such as Sodom and Gomorrah, such as the nation Egypt. And we know it's Jerusalem by what he says there in verse 8. Look at verse 9, though. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies for three and a half days and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in the grave. All the world sees them at the same time. And again, we know that that can happen. It's not, it's not a difficulty for us to see that it happens. And so it sees them and they gloat and they glorify their leader, the Antichrist. Isn't he fantastic? He killed these two guys. Got rid of them. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send one gifts to one, one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. Oh, a great celebration takes place. We say, how can that be? Don't we see with a lot of the kinds of things that are taking place now, uh, how buildings are being burnt and even people are hurt and everybody's jumping up and down and being excited and so forth? Can you imagine when these two witnesses are dead, the whole world will rejoice, exchanging gifts with one another, celebrating, probably dancing around their bodies, maybe burning down some more buildings, maybe jumping up and down, just celebrating. Wow. Well, let's see what happens next. There's a resurrection, verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. They stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. As they are celebrating, as the whole world is watching on television and seeing these guys, as they're dancing over these dead bodies, they are interrupted because life comes back into them. The breath of God was breathed into them. And so when these two men stood back up, all fear came upon all, everybody that was watching. How can this be? What's going on here? Panic will seize this unregenerated world. You imagine the instant replay on television over and over. They're going to show these two guys rise back up. And those that are standing around there watching that are right there where it's taking place, what's going to happen to them? They're going to run. They're going to hide. Some may even have shock. So the commentators, what are they going to say? Oh no, these two guys are alive. Are they going to begin preaching again? No, God has other plans. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying up to, unto them, Come up hither. And they send it up into heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Oh, that same voice that summoned up John when he told John to come up. It tells them to come up. And they went on to heaven. Will this be replayed? Will they show that again on television? Will it be there over and over showing them going on to heaven? Their ministry is done. So God says, come home, come home. I think that's for us too. I think that God gives us breath until our ministry is done. As long as we breathe, as long as we have life on this earth, there's something that God wants us to do. We better do it until God takes us home. So what's the impact? Now well, let's look at verse 13. And that same hour, that same hour, was there a great earthquake and the 10th part of the city fell. And in the earthquake were there slain of men 7,000 and the remnant was affrightened and gave glory to the God of heaven. All right, things are taking place. The Jews are giving glory to God. They realize, they understand what, is what has happened here. Verse 14, the second woe was past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. The interlude is now ended. The seventh trumpet will now sound, bringing these seven final bowl judgments, which are going to be what you will study in weeks to come. But let's look at that seventh trumpet for just a minute. These are the final events leading up to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And these last three trumpets, that we've seen five, six, and now seven are so horrific. They're referred to as woe, woe. 
Well, let's look at the praise, though, for this sovereignty in verse 15. Praise for sovereignty in verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there was a great voice in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. Oh, when that seventh trumpet sounds, there's immediate jubilation. There's expressing exhilaration about what is just about to take place. Certainly Satan's power has been evident during this time, but God's reign is supreme. God will reign. Jesus Christ will reign. The rebellion of man against God is about to end. And today all the kingdoms of this world, all the kingdoms of this world that we see happening right now today, politically, culturally, socially, religiously, they become under one king. God takes control. There are many names for the king of this world. Beelzebub, Belial, the dragon, the roaring lion, the tempter, the evil one, Satan, the devil, on and on and on. And even though today it is God who sets up the kingdom, his kingdoms refuse to submit to him or acknowledge his sovereignty today. Unbelievable, you and I are part of the kingdom of God because we've accepted Jesus Christ, but there are many who refuse. And Satan fights, but he's going to lose. He's going to lose. The Lord Jesus Christ will reign as we sang about this morning. Literally, he lived and he died for it. Look at verse 16. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshiped God. The four and twenty elders, you remember who that is? That's us. That's the church. And we begin to praise because Jesus Christ is going to set up His kingdom. It now belongs to Him. Satan is going to be defeated. And listen to the praise in verse 17, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. The Almighty, the all-powerful God, who is and who are, will continually be eternal, and you have taken. This is the performance of God's sovereign rule. This has always been God's plan in God's time, in God's way. It's going to take place. Well, what happens? Look at the rage in verse 18. And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, that they should us give reward unto the servants, the prophets, to the saints, and them that fear the name, small and great, as should us destroy them which destroy the earth. And the nations were angry. They're defiant. They're enraged at the prospect of Jesus Christ setting up his kingdom to where he is established over the entire earth. We don't want this. We like our Satan leader. We want to follow him. That anger's got to be so deep-seated. It's an ongoing anger. Oh, we see some of that going on today. And it's not just a momentary emotional fit of temper, but it is a bitter resentment of God. It's settled in them. They hate God. And we see that in our world today. They are angry. And so God brings out that planned judgment there in verse 18. It's in God's time to reward His servants, His prophets, all the saints, small and great. But it's also God's time to destroy those who have been destroyed by living a life of sin, not willing to give their life over to God. So a promise comes. A promise of communion in verse 19. And the temple of God oh, was opened in heaven. And there were seen in the temple the Ark of the Testaments, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and earthquakes and a great hail. That temple is open. Some of the pictures we saw this morning of that just opening up the unbroken fellowship that we're going to be ha having with God. The Ark symbolizes communion with God for the redeemed. That's for us. But the latter part of verse 19 talks about this judgment. Heaven is the source of judgment for unbelievers with the lightnings and the thunderings and the voices and the earthquakes and the great hail. God is a God of love, a God of mercy, but God also has to judge that which will not turn to Him. God has given man every opportunity. He says, every man is without excuse. Listen, if you're here this morning and you don't know for sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die, the Bible is clear to tell you 
It's not that you become a Baptist. It's not that you become a church member. It's that you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. And you need to do that before this time comes. And as we see things taking place in this earth today, it's coming soon. Are you ready? Are you ready? And then as I've challenged us every week, just like he told John, just like he told those two witnesses, he tells us, preach it. Tell them about my love. Tell them about my redemption. Go to your loved ones, go to your neighbors, go to your co-workers, go to your friends. Tell them, tell them, preach it, preach it. Would you bow your heads? We're going to have a word of prayer. Then I'm going to ask you to stand after our prayer and sing a verse of invitation. And this is a house full of those that love God and love what God wants to do. So it should be freedom for you to do what the Holy Spirit is convicting you to do this morning. Do it. Get it done. Whether it's just to come to the altar and pray or to meet with one of our deacons here and see what needs to be done in your life or to find Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Father, we thank you for the gospel. We thank you that it is so true, beginning in Genesis all the way to Revelation, it shows your mercy, your love, how you've given to us that opportunity to have eternal life, to life with you. And so God, we pray this morning, if there's anybody here that does not know you as Savior, that they've been convicted, Holy Spirit is speaking to them, telling them to do it now, do it now. And then for we as believers, God, we know us soon, we see that. And we know there are people around us that do not know you and how terrible for them to have to go through this terrible time of judgment. Oh God, give us that courage, the words to speak to them. Let's all stand together as we sing just as I am. That's how God sees you just as you are. What do you need to do this morning? Let's sing. your being here this morning and I just can't help but think that you know as you see as we see the pictures of some of the terrible things that are happening around our country today and, and people that are being physically beaten and so forth can you imagine watching television during the tribulation and seeing those things happen my I, I trust that God will give you somebody to talk to this week to share the gospel with Holy Spirit is convicting people each and every day. And again, if you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus Christ as your savior, you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, talk to somebody, talk to one of us, let us show you how you can know. Well, we're gonna be dismissed now and go back and over to the fellowship hall and uh, I think the guys are cooking some food. There's also other kinds of thing there. We're just gonna have a good time of fellowship and uh, no service tonight. Remember all of the other announcements that are there. Don't forget to pick up the prayer sheets that are in the back for the uh, days of prayer during here. Arnold, would you come and dismiss us from prayer, please, sir? Shall we pray? 
Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we've heard another message this morning of what's coming, Father, we just pray if there's anybody here that's never put their faith and trust in you, that they'll take this to heart, Father. Just help them to talk to somebody about their salvation, Father, before this day is out. And for us that, that do know Christ as Savior, help us to be the witness and the testimony that we need to be, Father, as we go forward. Lord, we know time is short, and we just pray that you'll give us the, the uh, encouragement and the will and the power to do your will, Father. We just thank you now again for this service. Be with each one that's here. Watch over and protect them and bring them back next week. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.